uh, but if you do have a seat near you, if you could just kind of let your hands rise, uh, that will really uh, help us keep the fire marshal uh, happy. Well, uh, good evening, and uh, welcome to my lecture on the Songbirds of Saanich. Uh, that, that is where you plan to be tonight, I, I should hope. Seriously, uh, welcome, uh, good evening. Uh, this is going to be a wonderful uh, panel discussion. Clearly a very uh, hot topic within our community on climate change in the media. Scientists, scribes, and spinmeisters. Um, tonight we have at least three, uh, three of these types of people, and I'll introduce them in, uh, in just a moment, and you can choose which ones you think they are. Uh, my name is Howard Brent. I'm the Vice President Researcher at the University of Victoria, and it's uh, my pleasure uh, to serve, I hope, uh, as the MC for tonight. I've heard people saying they brought tomatoes. Uh, I would ask you to keep them, take them home, uh, eat them tomorrow for dinner. Arguably, there is no single issue with more coverage in the media over the past number of years than climate change. But how do we separate the facts from the spin? and from the opinions, and how does the media help or hinder us to make sense of this critically important issue? Well, over the course of the evening, we're going to be exploring this in some depth with an expert panel who I'll be introducing in, in just a minute. The format for this evening is that we're going to hear from our panelists. They'll make a brief presentation, 10 to 15 minutes each. This will be followed by a period of questions from you in the audience. We are also taking questions uh, over the internet, and those will be handed to me to try to fill in, uh, but I, I fully imagine there'll be lots of questions uh, in this room. Um, I do want everyone to know that this uh, session is being um, webcast, and uh, so I, I just have to read this to you uh, so you understand it. Please note that the University of Victoria is producing a live webcast of this special event for broadcasting purposes. Should you have concerns or wish to not be filmed, please advise organizers and or the camera crew. Now, I don't know the logistics of that, uh, but what I, what I have been assured is there is no camera at, coming at you, at the audience, it's all from behind. Uh, but should every, anyone have a concern about that, uh, please let uh, the organizers know. Uh, I would suggest at the end of the session, and we will uh, do our very best, should there be any inadvertent filming, uh, to uh, take, take care of that uh, once it's uh, over. So, with no further ado, it's now my pleasure uh, to introduce our scientists, scribes, and spinmeisters. First, I'd like to uh, introduce Mr. Jim Hogan. Jim is the president of Vancouver-based Hogan & Associates, one of Canada's leading public relations firms. A law school graduate with a long-standing interest in social justice, Jim is also a leading authority on public perceptions about business, the, uh, the environment, climate change, and sustainability. His company has been recognized by the PR Society of America for its excellence in crisis communications and by the Canadian Public Relations Society of BC chapter for its high ethical and professional standards. Its most recent book is Climate Cover-Up, and I think you saw copies uh, as you came in. So welcome, Jim. It's a pleasure to also introduce Ms. Lucinda Choden. Lucinda has been the Editor-in-Chief of the Times Colonist since 2005, and in the past three years has overseen the relaunch and the redevelopment of its website to make it a 24-7 news platform and community portal. She's a former National Newspaper Award winner who now oversees a newsroom staff who have won six National Newspaper Awards, one Mich Michener Award for Public Service jur Journalism, and nine Webster Award nominations for excellence in BC journalism. Lucinda, we're delighted to have you with us. I'd now like to introduce Mr. Uh, Dr. Tom Peterson. Tom is the director of the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions, hosted and led by the University of Victoria, and is the former dean of this faculty of science. He has a, holds a degree in geology from the University of British Columbia and marine geochemistry from the University of Edinburgh. 
He was elected to a fellowship in the Royal Society of Canada in 2002 and a fellowship in the American Geophysical Union in 2006. Thomas published extensively in the field of paleo-oceanography, which is the history of the ocean and therefore of climate. Tom, welcome. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Calamine. Peter is one of Canada's preeminent science writers. He earned a physics degree at McMaster University and worked as a correspondent and editor for Southam Company for 30 years. He's had postings in Ottawa, London, England, Nairobi, and Washington, and even Regina, I understand, <laughs> if that's correct. Peter was a science reporter for the Canadian Daily Newspapers for 15 years, including a 10-year stint as a national science reporter for the Toronto Star. He's the founding member of the Canadian Science Writers Association, a three-time winner of a National Newspaper Award, and a member of the steering committee of the Science Media Centre of Canada. Welcome. I would just ask uh, those of you with mobile devices or watching uh, via the live webcast, uh, you can email your questions into us at PICS, that's P-I-C-S, at uvic.ca. So as uh, things are coming along, if you want to send those in, we'll try to uh, get those to a microphone. Um, there will be an opportunity, though, of course, for those of you in the audience for asking questions once these presentations are completed. I would ask that uh, all of you mute your mobile devices, however, uh, so we don't listen to Tchaikovsky or whatever you have as, as your ringtone. And now, with no further ado, it's my great pleasure to invite Jim Hogan to make the first presentation. So, <clears throat> because of what I'm going to be talking about, tonight, I thought that I should probably, uh, in the spirit of full disclosure, also mention that I'm the chair of the David Suzuki Foundation and the chair of Al Gore's climate project in Canada. So there's no confusion about what I think about climate change. Um, so it's an honor to, to be here tonight and... Uh, and thank you to Tom and uh, his team at PIX for setting this event up tonight. Thanks to all of you for coming out to listen to us. I, um, I want to tell you uh, a story. This is the climate cover-up story, the 15-minute version of uh, our book. This is a story about greed deception, and irresponsibility on an epic scale. And in, in its darkest chapters, it's a story about the poisoning of public judgment and the relentless manipulation of the news media. It's a story about the boatloads of coal and oil money that's been spent over the past two decades to harass climate scientists and confuse the public about climate change. This is the most widespread public misinformation campaign that I've come across in my 35 years in the public relations business. And before I tell you the rest of this story, I I want to explain uh, how I came to write this book. It's something my wife keeps asking me about and seems to still be unsatisfied with my answer. Because I, I really actually didn't go looking for trouble. I'm not uh, really an activist, or until recently, really much of an environmentalist. Um, and I certainly don't have a grudge against the establishment. I've owned a corporate public relations firm for 30 years. I've worked for big companies, big industries, uh, resource-based companies on all sides of environmental issues. I've lectured in business circles, at journalism schools, 
I've even written a how-to book on corporate public relations. And I have a reputation for being a very difficult, tough advocate for my clients. But setting that aside, I've always thought that even though it's my job to be a skilled advocate for my clients, it's also unethical for me to pervert information just because the facts don't suit my clients' interests or beliefs. We all have a right to our own opinions, but not to our own set of facts. And public relations advocacy that isn't tempered with honesty poisons public conversations and undermines the public interest. And that is what the climate cover-up story is all about. It's a, it tells a story of a widespread kind of Darth Vader approach to public relations that ignores uh, the need to balance um, corporate or ideological advocacy with honesty. Now, this whole project started for me quite innocently about five years ago. And we were redoing the Hogan website, and someone in my office suggested that we needed a sort of a community um, relations um, page. Um, and suggested that we do something on climate change because there was so much controversy. And maybe what we could do is have some kind of part of our site where people could go and they could be linked to other information sites where they could you know, run into some factual information. We could clear up some of the controversy. So I started reading before we were going to do this. And I was quite surprised because what I found was there wasn't any controversy. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, NASA, the Royal Society, the Royal Society of Canada, the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, virtually every major scientific academy in the world had agreed. Climate was changing, humans had something to do with it, and we should be worried about it. And yet, when, you, when I read the media, the news media, there was this raging debate going on. So, this is a quote that I came across when I was doing this research. Listen to this. The scientific basis for the greenhouse effect and the potential impact of human emissions of greenhouse gases, such as CO2, on the climate is well established and cannot be denied. Now that is not a quote from Al Gore. That was a quote written by Mobile Corporation's most senior scientist in 1995 in a report for an energy industry front group called the Global Climate Coalition. Now unfortunately, the guy who wrote that report stuck it in a drawer. And that's where it stayed until the New York Times dug it up last year. At the time that this report was written, the Global Climate Coalition was pushing an aggressive public relations campaign to sow doubt about climate science. And this report notwithstanding, they continued that campaign for seven more years until 2002. So, the more I read about this, uh, the more offended I became. I realized that this global warming debate wasn't taking place in legitimate scientific circles or in scientific journals. And that the debate that I was reading about in the mainstream media had the fingerprints of energy industry PR people all over it. So, I thought people should know about this. So I started a blog called Desmog Blog that eventually ended up in this book. And 
the PR campaigns that we talk about, we write about in the book, are all about selling doubt. You may have heard of the American public relations guy, Frank Luntz. In, in 2002, he was advising the Republican Party about environmental communications and what their position should be on the environment and climate change. And he said this, voters believe there is no consensus about global warming within the scientific community. Therefore, you need to continue to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue in the debate. And I assure you, these salesmen of doubt have done their job. Recent re uh, U.S. research found that the number of Americans who think there's solid evidence that the Earth is warming has fallen from 79% to 57 The number who believe that global warming is due to human activity has fallen from 47 to 36%. In the United Kingdom, people who believe that climate change is a definite reality has dropped by 30% over the last little while. And the number who believe that climate change is exaggerated has increased by 50%. This is at a time when the science is getting stronger. And this does not surprise me at all. It doesn't surprise me how confused people are because we have spent the last five years studying this and looking back over the past decades, we've documented a whole industry devoted to creating climate change confusion. We found energy in, in, uh, companies and manufacturers paying legions of public relations people, think tanks and compliant scientists to make the lack of scientific certainty a primary issue. We found industry documents setting out complete strategies to deny climate science and confuse people about its uh, implications. And I'm going to give you two examples. The Western Fuels Association in the US, which is a coalition of big coal-burning electric utilities, joined with the National Coal Association and the Edison Electrical Institute uh, in 1991 to create something called the Information Council on the Environment. And it started with two goals. Reposition global warming as a theory, not a fact. And supply alternative facts to support, support that global warming would be good. And on the advice of their PR firm, Bracey Williams and Co. ICE went into small US markets and did what we do in our business, uh, set up focus groups to test messages, including these. Some say the earth is warming. Some also said the earth was flat. Who told you the earth was warming? Chicken Little? And if the earth is getting warmer, why is the frost line moving south? Well, the frost line was not moving south. But that wasn't the point. Because they weren't testing these messages for accuracy, they were testing them for impact. They also, like all good PR people do when they have these focus groups, tested the credibility of spokespeople and found out that most folks don't believe industry spokespeople when uh, they're talking about the environment. But they do believe technical experts, people with white coats and PhDs. So ICE identified a group of compliant scientists, people like Patrick Michaels of the Cato Institute, who took coal money in return for creating doubt in news interviews. Now another strategy document that we found was created not by Big Oil, but by a tobacco company. Now, I don't know, some of you probably remember the early 90s. Those were bad times for tobacco. Uh, people were stopping smoking and there was all sorts of regulations about smoking in pub 
public places. And it was very difficult for these uh, tobacco companies to kind of fight these regulations. So, uh, so Philip Morris's uh, PR firm, APCO Worldwide, came up with this idea. And they created a grassroots group of independent scientists to help them make their case. They called this group the Advancement of Sound Science Coalition. Now, real grassroots groups represent the legitimate views of regular citizens who band together to spontaneously fight for a cause. This was not like the Montgomery Improvement Association that supported Rosa Parks in the civil rights movement in the 50s. TASC was an astroturf group. The, the grass was 100% fake. An early memo that you could get if you Googled the tobacco papers outlined their media strategy to, to manipulate public opinion. And their priorities were these. Establish TASC as a credible source for reporters when questioning the validity of scientific studies, and encourage the public to question from the grassroots up the validity of scientific studies. The important point here is that there was no intention to challenge the validity of science by actually doing research. This wasn't a lab strategy. This was PR. And Philip Morris, realizing how big its credibility problem was, just understood that it couldn't do this alone. So their PR firm invited 20,000 other businesses to join them in this fight for sound science. And Exxon said yes. Once you s start to see this AstroTurf uh, tactic, you start to see it everywhere. For example, the American Petroleum Institute was caught last year setting up fake rallies across the United States called energy citizen rallies, where they used rent-a-crowds and friendly, uh, industry-friendly experts to scare seniors with misinformation about the costs of US cap-and-trade leg legislation. So astroturfing has become as contagious as swine flu. There are dozens of public relations firms who specialize in this. Don't know if you've ever been to Washington. If you ever go there, see if you can find a street called K Street and look down it. Stop people who are walking down the street and you'll run into some of these people that you can't figure out whether they're a PR person, a lobbyist, or a lawyer. And there's thousands of them. They build anonymous websites, um, in these astroturfing PR firms. They set up boiler rooms full of low-wage employees and they coach them to misrepresent their purposes. They invent petitions, they create phony demonstrations, they charge $1,800 a picket, they harass politicians, they hire rent-a-crowds, or they order industry employees to try to make crowds look bigger. What they don't do is identify their clients. They don't say, Hi, we're from the Advancement of Sound Science Coalition, a front group for Philip Morris and ExxonMobil. They don't say, we're the Friends of Science, a Canadian astroturf group funded by the Alberta oil and gas industry. They don't say, we're the American Coalition for Clean Coal Electricity, a puppet organization of America's largest coal and electric companies. Well, that last organization hired one of these DC astroturf firms called Bonner and Associates. They were out to fight US uh, climate legislation last year. So Bonner filled its rooms, told employees to say they were representing seniors in your community, and they ended up getting caught forging letters of opposition from legitimate seniors groups and sending those letters to congressional people, people in advance of the vote. So in closing, um, I'm still well under my 15 minutes, I know. So um, this is an assault on democracy. And the perpetrators get away with it. Lobbyists in Canada and the United States have to declare who they're working for. 
Astroturfers don't. They can impersonate concerned citizens or legitimate scientists, and there's no law against it. No mechanism to expose their funding or their deceit. And no wonder we can't tackle climate change. We're paralyzed by public relations spin. We know that we should be skeptical, but we don't know who to trust. And trusting no one, we lose an opportunity to work together to solve this very serious environmental problem. If you doubt any of what I'm saying today, please read Climate Cover-Up. You'll find the evidence is overwhelming. You'll find strategy documents and trails of dirty money. You'll find the names of scientists for hire, think tanks for rent, individuals and organizations who will defend DDT, asbestos, CFCs, tobacco, or clean coal. And I hope that you find a sense of outrage about this and that after you get angry, you start to speak out against these kinds of tactics when you see them. And I hope you start to demand more from the news media. Journalists need to resist this type of manipulation and start to ask the basic questions about qualifications, scientific sources, and the funding behind these so-called skeptics. We should also insist that think tanks, front groups, and phony grassroots organizations are stripped of their right to hide their funding. Because our best chance to stop global warming is to have an open, honest, and transparent public conversation about it, not one that's being paid for and perverted by unethical business interests. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jim. Um, what a great setup for our next speaker. Uh, I'd like to bring in uh, Lucinda Choden, uh, who's had, I guess, a gauntlet thrown down uh, for the media. So my pleasure to uh, invite you up, Lucinda. <coughs> Thanks, Howard, and uh, glad to pick up that gauntlet. Um, I'm here to shed light on how newspapers, primarily newspapers, but to a certain extent other media cover uh, climate change and climate science. I should make it clear that I'm representing the Times Colonist, and I'm talking about how we operate at the Times Colonist. I don't speak for the rest of the newspapers in the CanWest newspaper group. Thank you. How's that? Better? Thanks. I don't speak for the rest of the newspapers in the CanWest newspaper group. The Times colonists, like the other newspapers in CanWest, set their own editorial policy. That is what they say editorially in their editorials about climate change and other things. Um, and we also choose the own, our own content, what appears on our news pages. So what I'm about to tell you has to do with what we do at the Times Colonist, although I would suggest to you that it's very similar in newsrooms across the country and particularly in medium-sized centers like Victoria. Now. I'm going to be talking to you about four main areas. The kinds of coverage that newspapers do, how our newsroom operates, what other sources are available to readers who are seeking information on climate change, and how our coverage has changed and is likely to change in the near future. As Howard said so eloquently at the beginning of his speech, uh, climate change has been at the forefront of scientific concern and public interest for several years now. Since January 2005, the Times Colonist has published 2,452 articles opinion columns, and letters to the editor that refer to climate change in some fashion. Many of those articles were generated by the news services to which we subscribe. The CanWest News Service, Reuters, Agence France Presse, and Bloomberg's, Bloomberg News. That's because climate change has national and international aspects as well as local aspects. But for our reportage on things like uh, the climate science, we for the most part rely on news service material generated by CanWest. 
Um, in addition to that, we do some local news coverage because the Institute, uh, the School of Earth and Ocean Sciences here at the University of Victoria has an international reputation. So our local coverage has tended to focus on um, how, what, what people here are doing vis-a-vis uh, -vis climate change. Back to the articles themselves. The first kind of article that we publish is the pure science article. These are like the article that you see in front of you. Uh, this one was written by Margaret Monroe, uh, CanWest's award-winning national science writer. Um, and it was about the report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that was released in February 2007. So pure science. Two, articles that talk about how climate change affects us. These are observed and expected effects of climate change. So these would be the articles that we write and publish about sea levels rising, glaciers melting, pine beetle infestation, drought, disruption of ecosystems in the oceans, etc. cetera. Um, this one happens to be about a team of scientists uh, exploring uh, the effect that global warming is having on glaciers in the Pacific Northwest. Third type of government, the third type of article that we publish is uh, sort of uh, public policy articles. What are governments doing and what are people asking governments to do locally, provincially, and federally, as well as internationally. Articles that would fall into this category are um, our coverage of Copenhagen, uh, the BC government's carbon tax, support for cap and trade emissions uh, control systems, carbon capture and storage, that kind of thing. You can see two kinds of, uh, two examples of that kind of coverage. Uh, I hope you'll notice the contents as well as our tendency to use the word blast in headlines. Uh, the first one is about the Nobel Prize winning scientist blasting the government. Uh, the second one is uh, our former uh, federal environment minister, John Baird, blasting uh, Alberta, uh, Ontario and Quebec about focusing uh, on emissions control rather than the federal government's plan for controlling pollution. The fourth kind of article I call uh, the politics of climate science. Um, climate gate, phrases like hide the decline, um, stories that are at the confluence of science and politics. Um, these are the kinds of stories I think that newspapers find most difficult to cover because you both have to understand the science and have to understand the politics that are motivating the parties in the articles. Um, this is a major challenge for uh, discipline newspaper reporting, which is very much traditionally based on an oppositional method. Person A says this, person B says that, you readers decide what you think. That stuff, wor that kind of approach works extremely well for an article about whether we should have a music festival in Beacon Hill Park. It is less effective when you're trying to cover a complex, nuanced and highly politicized subjects such as climate, ch climate change and climate science. Finally, there are editorials that we publish. Um, these editorials are not news coverage. They represent what the newspaper <coughs> believes and they don't influence our news coverage, but they do to our public, to our readers, indicate what we stand for and what we believe as a newspaper. It, these articles are determined by me, the editor-in-chief, working with our editorial board and with the approval of the publisher. Our editorial position on climate change, which we reiterated on November 28, 2009, is that there is undeniable evidence that climate change is occurring and that one of the major causes of global climate change is human activity. All of those articles are produced in a newsroom that has changed a great deal from the one I joined when I uh, started in newspapers uh, some years ago. For one thing, newspapers like the Times Colonist and city newspapers have decided, looking at the vast array of information around them, that the unique selling proposition, our promise to our readers, is that we will cover local news better than anyone else. That means that, to a certain extent, stories like climate change in the Times Colonist often get pushed onto inner pages in the A section because our front section, the front part of the front section, is completely devoted to local news on almost every day. 
In addition to that local focus, which was not the case 10 years ago, um, we have a greater influence on 24-7 um, rapid coverage of events. In the past, newspapers often had a couple of hours, uh, which doesn't seem that long, but in our world, a couple of hours is quite a lot of time. Now, if somebody were covering tonight's climate change panel, I would expect them to sit down after we've all stopped talking and file something immediately on a BlackBerry for our website and then go back to the office and write a longer and more nuanced, I hope, uh, and complex article for the next day's paper. So there are deadline pressures that are even more intense than the ones that pertained uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Another a factor that is quite different is that there is competition for us, not only traditional uh, competition such as television and radio, but online competition. The online websites of CFAX and A Channel and Check, but also people who are attending meetings like this and posting things to websites. Uh, I mentioned uh, VibrantVictoria.com, uh, WTF Langford, uh, and myriad others who are also covering news from a local point of view. Who is doing that coverage? Well, they are people who are mostly gifted generalists at city newspapers across North America. Um, the Globe and Mail and the National Post have a different um, sort of mandate, as does the New York Times and uh, publications like the Wall Street Journal. They are writing for a national audience. The Times Colonist, the Journal in Edmonton, the Calgary Herald are writing for people who live in a geographical area. Their reporters tend to be people who do have beats. They are sort of the environment reporter or the uh, health reporter or whatever. But on any given day, they might be asked to write a story about a dead whale or Bear Mountain's property, uh, financial woes, or anything else, the C. difficile outbreak in Nanaimo. What else about these people? Well, they're committed profoundly to balance and fairness. I mentioned before that there is an oppositional model of traditional newspaper reporting. That's because newspaper reporters are profoundly dedicated to making sure that what they report is to the greatest extent possible in a short time frame. I know that sounds like a lot of cavils, but uh, to provide readers with balanced information. Again, that is not always the best approach to look for, uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, kind of reportage. They're really good at one-time events. They call them newspapers for a reason. If it's news, they're unbelievably good at gathering, sorting, and condensing news in a hurry. Long-term and ongoing stories are not necessarily the forte of somebody who can go to an accident on the Malahat, find out what happened, and file a report on a Blackberry. They're individualistic, they're independent-minded. They don't want to be told what to think. They fight against orthodoxy and they've got plenty of time for somebody who calls them up and says, I know everybody says that uh, uh, you know, the government isn't cutting success by six, but I can give you a leaked paper that says they are. In other words, they are almost genetically or certainly by training predisposed to look for a dissenting point of view. I'd like also specifically to refer to columnists because I know that uh, some of the controversy about newspaper coverage of climate change has to do with columns rather than news coverage. Columnists have an amazing uh, freedom to write what they believe. In fact, we encourage them to write things that are not being said elsewhere, um, to go against the popular opinion, to dissent from what the newspaper's official editorial policy is. It would be extremely boring and completely undemocratic to say, well, we support uh, whomever, so you have to write a column that is in concurrence with that. On the other hand, we expect those columnists to base their columns on discernible facts. And in our newsroom, if you reliably do not base your column on facts, you don't have a column. Who else is out there? Well, we're, the Times Colonist and daily newspapers are no 
by no means the only place that people can find out about climate change and what's happening. Um, there are plenty of sources out there competing for people's attention. Uh, when I did a Google search of climate change yesterday, I got 48,500,000 results. Many of those results are based on blogs, uh, our websites put together by people who are very passionately interested in climate change. Everything from Real Climate, which is a website that's run by top climate scientists, to What's Up With That, which is, it was a, it voted the top science blog of the year in 2009, and it's run by a TV weatherman. The blogosphere is a petri dish for conspiracy theories that can be disseminated instantly and internationally. It is a gathering place for people who have common interests. And I think that has given fuel to many of the passionate movements uh, and spokespeople for climate change. So what's next for newspaper and media coverage of climate change? I deliberately put up uh, three publications that I think in their own way have immense credibility, uh, accuracy, and trust from their readers. Those are, as you can see, The Economist, The New York Times, and The Toronto Star. Um, Jim has been pretty critical of the media and newspapers in terms of how they have covered climate change in the past. I would have to agree that there have been some credulous stories written in the past on all kinds of subjects. On the other hand, I do think that things have changed. Although newspaper coverage in particular has been a bit hit and miss in the past, and although we have been slow to grasp some of the manipulation that is out there, I do believe that newspapers and other media in print and online are the best way to convey information about climate change for a couple of reasons. Number one, we have reporters whose jobs involve trying to sift out the truth from often conflicting and confusing information. Second, those reporters strive to be impartial and objective. They don't have a political or an economic interest to advance. Third, they reach a mass audience, one that has an expect expectation from them of credible and accurate reporting. Newspapers have a dog in this race. What differentiates us from bloggers and tweeters is a commitment to that credible and accurate reporting. In a universe where we are competing fairly successfully, uh, not what you hear in other media, we are competing for readers and listeners and online audiences with a myriad of other sources. It is in our best interest as a medium to make sure that Accuracy and credibility are what people come to us for. How does that translate in practical terms for our coverage locally? We need to prepare our own reporters better. They need to be better informed. They need to know the difference between peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed science. They need to know the difference between science and politics. And they need to be sure that they are seeking out people who are credible, uh, from credible institutions when they do reporting on some climate science. On a larger scale, from our news wire services, including CanWest News, we have to seek accountability for them and push back when there are things that we see that are not credible. There are two reporters at CanWest who are responsible for most of the coverage of climate change. They're both experienced and highly accurate. I think they're well respected in the scientific world. Their names are Margaret Monroe, who writes about science, Mike D'Souza, who writes about the poli politics end of things. And I and the other editors in CanWest are very vigilant about keeping them honest and keeping CanWest News Service supplying us with reputable information. Third, columnists have to be held accountable for the opinions that they espouse in the pages of the newspapers. As Jim said, you're entitled to your own opinion. You're entitled to your own opinion, but you have to use the real facts. I think newspapers have to be much more responsible about dealing with columnists who don't adhere to those facts. Thank you.
thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Lucinda. It's now my pleasure uh, to uh, welcome uh, Tom Pedersen up uh, to talk to us um, and share his views. Tom? Thank you, Howard. I'm going to address four points here tonight. The first two I'm going to conflate a little bit. You'll see them there on the screen. I want to define something for you this evening. Noise versus signal, and weather versus climate. And when climatologists talk about weather, what they're typically thinking of is the noisy record that the Earth's climate system presents to us, to those of us that go out and make measurements of various parameters and processes in the Earth's system. But when you think in terms of a signal, what we're thinking about there is what's happening over the longer term. And very often these concepts get confused, and they're very often confused in the media, in fact, and I'm going to show you some examples of that coming up here in a few minutes. And then I'm going to go on to mention one name in particular, my loquacious, multisyllabic, erudite friend, Rex Murphy. <laughs> But Rex is cast from a mold which is unique in this country, perhaps because he's from Newfoundland. I, I don't quite know why, but he writes columns which have an interesting slant to them, which frankly is wrong, and I'm going to, to show you some examples of that and explain why they are wrong. And this follows directly on from Lucinda's point about essentially about intellectual ethics. It's important for columnists to offer an opinion. No one disputes that. In a democracy, it's very important to have opinions out there. But those opinions must be rooted in facts. It's wrong to present an opinion that's rooted in fiction. And then finally, I'll say a few words about responsibility. And all of us have responsibility, including the scientists. And I'll say a few words about that in a, sm in a moment. So let me first define this this contrast between signal and noise. What you see on the screen here is a set of random numbers that I've just scaled and I put a, a scale on the bottom in terms of year. You could think of this, if you like, as some kind of a climate record. On the vertical axis, you can see that I've written there temperature anomaly. And if you look at that, these are just random numbers set between two boundaries running through time. And you can see that it's a noisy record. There's lots of bumps and wiggles in that record, but there's no trend. This is what I would consider to be a, a kind of a proxy example for what Mother Nature does with the planetary climatic system. For almost 10,000 years now, we've had a very stable climate on this planet. Until the last two centuries, climate has been relatively stable. It has allowed human civilizations to flourish at an unparalleled pace. And so if you look at those data there on the screen, what you're seeing is, in climatological terms, no trend. The climate is stable. Now, if you, if you want, if you refer to that little blue line that's now up there on the screen, this little line that I've just added here, you could say that, you know, in the decade between 1950 and 1960 or so, it looks like it got cold. My God. There is a trend, but climatologically there is not a trend because the World Meteorological Organization defines climate change as a 30-year moving average of the statistics of weather. So you need to have three decades of data in order to define a trend if you're a climatologist. Or you could pick another decade. Remember that these are artificial data. There's nothing real here. You could pick this decade and say, my God, it's getting hot. The Earth is warming up at a furious pace. Well, both of those perspectives are wrong from a climate scientist's position because this data set has no trend to it. These are what we call cherry picking. And you'll see the media typically offers opinions, uh, particularly in columnists, not so much journalists. Reporters are actually are pretty darn good in this country, but some of the columnists will cherry pick and they'll make a trend where no actual trend exists. And I'll show you some examples of that coming up. So cherry picking is a term that Jim Hogan is very well aware of. It's commonly used in the public relations industry, particularly in the climate denial movement, to try and suggest something is happening which actually is not. 
Now, I've just done one other thing to that same data set. The previous red line, I've just done one little change to it. It's exactly the same set of random numbers, except I've now added eight thousandths of a degree of warming per year. That's all I've done. That's about the degree of warming that we've enjoyed over the last hundred years or so. And you can see now that we do have a trend. That curve is quite clearly rising toward the right. And quite clearly, it suggests that there has been warming. If we put a line through that, you can see very clearly that there's a nicely defined trend in these data. And if we compare it to our no trend situation, you can see the contrast is pretty profound. And in fact, our cherry picked pieces, you know, we can move them up on the other curve and we can cherry pick a decade there where it looks like it was getting warmer. Or we can cherry pick a decade where it looks like it was getting cooler. But you have to be pretty darn, what's the word I'm going to use here? Selective. Selective, thank you. I was going to say ignorant. Selective is much better. Thank you. Pretty darn selective. In fact, you have to put your head in the sand to claim that there's no trend in those data, at least for the blue line. So now let's look at some real data. Here's the global temperature record since 1880 based on literally thousands of sites, made measurements made by thermometers, averaged over the, the, the entire surface of the Earth. This is a global land and ocean compilation produced by the uh, GIST Laboratory in New York, part of the NASA group. And you can see quite clearly that we have a trend here. There's also a lot of noise. There are a lot of wiggles in this curve. But Quite distinctly, there is a trend. This is the temperature anomaly over the last 130 years. And you can put a line through those. This is just a hand-drawn line. It's not mathematically drawn, but it's hand-drawn. And you can see quite clearly that there's a trend there. And it looks like it might well be accelerating over the last several decades in terms of the warming. But there is a lot of noise. And if we start to look at that noise, if we pick 1998, for example, that was one of the warmest years in recent history. And we understand why it was so warm. We understand why there's a spike in that graph. And that was the year when there was the mother of all El Ninos that started to build in the fall of 1997 and went through much of 1998. And an El Nino is a phenomenon in the ocean where the West Pacific warm pool that's sort of centered on Indonesia has a big deep pool of extremely warm water. It's pushed there by the trade winds. When the trade winds relax, which they do periodically every four to seven years, the trade winds just say, I'm going on vacation. They relax. They stop pushing the water toward Indonesia, right from all the way from Panama right across the Pacific. So that big deep pool of warm water that's sitting over there been held there by the wind. In fact, you may or may not know that sea level in Indonesia is maybe 60 or 80 centimeters higher than sea level in Panama. And it's wind pressure that's maintaining that contrast. The trade winds relax, the warm water washes back across the Pacific, and this white zone that you can see here so well represented, this is a satellite image of temperature anomaly. This white zone here is hot water that came from the Indonesian side of the Pacific right across the Pacific in late 1997. It bathed the entire eastern equatorial Pacific with a thin layer of very warm water that radiated heat up into the atmosphere and warmed the planet. And that explains why we have that spike in 1998. Climate is complicated on this planet. It's not simple. In 1991, many of you will remember that there was a massive volcanic explosion in the Philippines. Mount Pinatubo exploded. It's a bit of an unusual volcano. It had a very sulfur-rich magma in it. It injected 20 million tons of sulfur dioxide into the upper atmosphere. Sulfur dioxide reacts with water vapor. It gets oxidized to sulfate forms tiny white particles, like a thin suspended haze, high in the atmosphere, that reflect sunlight back into space. And the Earth cooled. It dramatically and suddenly cooled because of the eruption of Pinatubo, both the culmination of the dust and the aerosol 
particles that it put up in the atmosphere and this sulfate issue caused cooling. And you can see that cooling very well represented there in 1991-92. There have been many such episodes in the past. A famous one that affected Canada was the Indonesian volcano of Tambora, which erupted in 1815. And I say it affected Canada because in 1816, the following summer, the corn harvest failed in Quebec because it was a cold summer. They got snow in August. People starved. This is a well-known natural phenomenon, and it adds noise to the climatological trend that you can see there. And there are other influences. There's a long list here, but I'll just show you one other one, the sun. We like to think of the sun as being always there for us and nice and stable. And on, a whole, on the whole, it is pretty darn stable. But it has an 11 year or so solar cycle attached to it, a sunspot cycle that does change the brightness of the sun. And it changes the number of watts of power or energy that we're getting from the sun per square meter. Not by very much. At the top of the atmosphere, if we were to put a disk right at the top of the atmosphere, we receive from the sun 1,366 watts per square meter from the sun. The variation caused by the 11 year sunspot cycle is about one watt per square meter. So it's one part in 1,366. It's a small effect, but it's there. And if we were to devolve or deconvolve this record, with a Fourier transform, a mathematical technique, we could actually find that there is an 11 year cycle embedded in that record. It's small, but it's there. So that's another factor that affects the climate system. Okay, so, <laughs> that was just a teaser. <laughs> so we have a lot of complexity in the climate system, no doubt about that, but I want to reinforce one thing. That black line very clearly shows us that there is a trend. We cannot explain that trend through either looking at the sun or through El Nino or through volcanoes. We can explain much of the noise, but not the trend. There's something else behind the trend. So let's now look at what our erudite friend from Newfoundland suggests is happening. This is from last July. I call him in the Globe and Mail. And, and his piercing blue eyes, I, I, I get entirely enamored by Rex Murphy's piercing blue eyes. <laughs> The, the, the heading in that column was, so where is the global cooling alert? And you can read the text there. You know, he takes Al Gore to task and, and Jim Hogan's colleague David Suzuki to task and, and Jim Hansen, the very famous climatologist at NASA Guess, who's one of the very best in the world. And he says, as you can see, the great trend line of an ever warming world is being contradicted nightly in their own forecasts. In other words, things are getting cold. So global warming is, must be fiction. Well, here's what the world looked like in July. The top panel shows you the temperature distribution in July. It was the fifth warmest July in all of human history. But look where Toronto is. It was chilly. It was chilly in Rex Murphy's backyard last July 24th. <laughs> and so he said, God, it's cold today. I'm going to say that global warming is a myth. That's essentially what he was saying in his column. But if you look at Vancouver on that map, if you can make out the dot for Vancouver, at the same time, we were setting record highs here in Victorian Vancouver. And it was sweltering in Europe. And it was very warm in the Australian winter. It was the fifth warmest July on record. Why would we want a global cooling alert? Rex, you gotta get out of your backyard. <laughs> look at the bottom one, two months later, it was the second warmest September on record. It was sweltering across much of Canada in September. We had an extremely warm month. And Rex did not write a column about the warmth. I don't understand it. So let's go back and think, now what was he actually on about? Well, here's our temperature record again. I've called it a Murphy myth. He was suggesting that the planet is cooling. And you, you have to be an enemy of statistics to draw that conclusion. <laughs> because the truth is right there in front of us. And this is not just true of temperature. All you have to do is go out and look at what's happening around the world. Almost every alpine glacier in the world is shrinking. 
The ocean is warming. We measure this with thermometers. Permafrost is melting. Sea level is rising as heat percolates into the ocean interior and water expands as it gets warmer. The fringes of Greenland, the ice cap in Greenland, are melting. The West Antarctic ice sheet is melting. Very large pieces of ice are calving into the sea now. It's happening all around us, so we can see this happen. And we understand the physics of this very well now. So to make the claim that the Earth is cooling, I'm really puzzled by how someone with considerable intellectual horsepower can draw that conclusion. I think there has to be some other agenda that is driving that particular individual to, to draw that conclusion. But I'm not finished, and neither was Rex. <laughs> On October, he had another column, but this time he took a different tack. He said, as you can see there, carbon dioxide has increased, but temperatures have not. Well, let's take a look at that. On the, on the graph now, you can see the carbon dioxide measurements that have been made since 1958 by Charles David Keeling at the Mauna Loa Observatory, which is a very high altitude volcanic site in Hawaii, purposely chosen because it's an area where the atmosphere is well mixed, it's far from cities, it's far from coal burning power plants, it's far from automobile tailpipes, and as a result, the carbon dioxide concentration that you measure at that site is representative of the atmosphere and not a, an automobile tailpipe. Those are very, very good data. And if you plot those data, right there on top of the temperature curve, you can see that there's a very strong correlation amongst them or between them. We understand why that correlation exists. A very famous Irish physicist named John Tyndall in 1859 described his experiments with a relatively newly discovered gas called carbon dioxide. And he measured the absorption of infrared radiation by that carbon dioxide in a series of laboratory experiments that he carried out in, in the UK. Since that time, we have understood implicitly and with high degree of accuracy how carbon dioxide absorbs infrared radiation. Now, you can think of infrared as the radiant heat that comes off a warm Earth's surface and is attempting to escape back to space. The Earth, of course, has been warmed up by the sun via shortwave radiation, visible light largely. It's warm and it radiates back towards space in the form of infrared. And carbon dioxide molecules intercept that and they absorb it. And then they re-release it and some of it makes its way back to space, but some of it comes right back at us. And so those carbon dioxide molecules that we have been adding to the atmosphere for 200 years now, they're biting us now because they are helping the planet retain heat, not something that we particularly want. We understand the physics of that implicitly. It's been known for 100, over 100 years now. And so for Rex to make the claim that carbon dioxide is increased but temperatures are not implies a basic inability or unwillingness to explore the relationship between those two. What he's done there, of course, is he's cherry-picked. He took a little trend. I don't know which trend he took. He doesn't offer data in his columns. So he's not, he, Rex isn't a scientist. But you know, he cherry-picked. He took a, a line like the white one I've just drawn on there, and he used that as his guide to make the claim that global warming is a myth. Sorry, Rex, but you're not right. And so that leads me to my conclusion here about responsibility, and I'll come back to the phrase intellectual ethics. I pose a question, and I think that this has been very well addressed by Lucinda and to some extent by Jim, but, but don't columnists and editorial writers and TV commentators have a responsibility to base their opinions on facts? I think the answer to that question is yes. Are we complicit in this as members of the public? Are we not demanding enough? Who's holding the, the feet to the fire of the media barons? Is the court of public opinion too soft? Maybe we should be speaking up more as a, as a human society. And finally, the scientists, you know, my colleagues and I, we're not particularly very good at getting out there in the public and, and rabble-rousing with the truth. We would rather, we'd rather, much rather 
convey our ideas and thoughts in scientific journals, which I suspect many of you may not go home at night and read at bedtime. <laughs> and so I think that we are also complicit, that we need to become more open, more accessible to all of us and all of you and all of the media so that the truth can prevail rather than fiction. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom. And it's now my pleasure, uh, last but not least, to uh, invite Peter Kalamai up uh, to present his views. Peter. Thank you very much, Howard, and thank you for having me. Um, I had some prepared remarks, and I've thrown them away, because um, I find myself in the not entirely unusual position of agreeing with all three previous speakers in general and disagreeing with them on specifics. Um, and so I'm going to run through some of that, um, but I'm going to make another couple of comments uh, first. The one is I spent 10 years working for the most local newspaper in Canada. There is, as Lucinda knows perfectly well, no newspaper that preaches the doctrine of everything is local that matters other than the Toronto Star. And yet I wrote in the Toronto Star, and I've tried to do the calculation here, but somewhere about 1,300 to 1,500 science articles over those 10 years, and at least 200 of them were about climate change. At least 200 of them were about climate change. Some days, some weeks, some months, I wrote nothing but climate change, and I was writing for the most local newspapers. So my point is that in the terms of the editors of the Toronto Star, and in my mind, climate change was a local issue. It is a local issue. It happens to have a global effect, but it also happens to have a local impact. And it's a lack of uh, inspiration, a lack of, in, of uh, application, a lack of imagination, mostly, when newspapers say that they have to put climate change stories inside because they're not local. They can be made to be local, and I did it at the most local newspaper in the country. And if you can do it at the Toronto Star, you can, you can do it anywhere, believe me. Um, this is not telling Lucinda how to run her newspaper because I wouldn't pre presume to do so. I never reach the exalted heights of editor-in-chief. In I'm talking about it from the point of view of, of a reporter. Um, and I also agree with all the remarks that editors and reporters have to do a better job, and my main theme is going to be how they do a better job. Let me go back to something James Hogan said. He said that the manipulation of the media on this issue is relentless and unparalleled. And I've read uh, the book by James Hogan and Richard Littlemore, who used to be an editorial writer, writer like me, and I have to tell you that I didn't get that impression in Canada. In Canada, I certainly got the impression that there was plenty of evidence that it was relent relentless and unparalleled in the United States. But in the book, to judge from the book, uh, the two examples are the National Post, a newspaper so unpopular that they have to give it away in most of the country. <laughs> All right? You don't have to pay for the National Post if you don't want to. You can get it free anywhere. They've even stopped printing it in parts of Canada because they can't even give it away successfully. So why would you care? And the second one was the Calgary Herald in the middle of the oil capital of Canada. And what would you expect, right? I mean, oh my gosh. The Calgary Herald is taking the side of oil and gas. Wow. So, and those were the examples. Uh, the largest newspaper in Canada, the newspaper that outsells the Globe and Mail two to one in Toronto every day, not one mentioned that it had been manipulated or there had been, you know, it had got its facts wrong or even that its columnist had gone off track. In fact, the Toronto Star was quoted in there because we broke the story about the Harper government relying on the Lutz, remember I mentioned Lutz memo. We were the ones who broke it. We're not credited with it. The Kitchener-Waterloo record is credited with it, but it was our story which the Kitchener-Waterloo record printed. You know, so. So I don't believe that the media, media have been manipulated in Canada relentlessly in an unparalleled fashion on climate change. 
I also don't think, with due deference to uh, Tom here, that it matters a hell of a lot what Rex Murphy writes about. <laughs> Rex Murphy doesn't even work for the Globe and Mail, right? He's paid for with your tax dollars. As, as, it's true, CBC, right? Uh, the Globe pays him for the column, but he's not an employee of the, of the Globe and Mail. Rex Murphy is the type of columnist who is preaching to the converted. Right? Nothing Rex Murphy says would, would cause an intelligent, independently thinking person to change their mind about climate science. <laughs> it would cause people who had already decided what way they wanted to think to say, yes, it must be right because Rex Murphy says I'm right. But it would have no influence whatsoever on the other type of people. And I just asked Lucinda to make sure when I'm going to make this statement whether or not she had ever been a columnist. And it turns out she had been a columnist. Am I right? Country music columnist? Is that correct? <laughs> a long time ago. I know, a long time ago. I wrote a weekly, a weekly column on current affairs for s six years as the editorial page editor of the Ottawa Citizen, which was the largest newspaper in the Southam group and you know the most important newspaper in the Can West group until the National Post started. I could write the column because I was in charge of the page, so of course you can put your own column on the page when you're the editor, right? You know? But I know the tricks that columnists get up to. And I also know that in good newspapers, in ethical newspapers, columnists have to abide by the one rule, that opinion is free and facts are sacred. No, nothing was printed on the pages of the paper that I was responsible for if we had doubt that the facts were correct. If facts were right, then people could draw any conclusion they wanted to. People would read it, they would see the facts, and they would say, how the hell can they reach that opinion based on those facts, right? I think a lot of people, when they're talking about the pernicious influence of columnists, the Margaret Wentys and, and you know, Rich Murphys of the world, think readers are stupid. They really do. They think they can be gulled and stupid. And I didn't hear any statistics about Canadian views on climate change. I heard what the Brits think, and I heard what the Americans think. But I didn't hear any empirical evidence at all about what Canadians think. And I don't happen to think that Canadians think like Americans. I know it's an unpopular opinion, but I'm going to hold it anyhow. Right? I don't think we happen to be clones of George Bush's United States. I think we're a little bit different. And I think we're different on things like that. And I think we do think about it, because I think we take our democracy a lot more seriously than they do. So let me talk for a minute about how I think we can do something about all this. And one of the ways in which I think we can do something about this is, is really work on a subject that's been overlooked in this country, which is public engagement with science. I'm not saying public communication of science. There's lots of public communication of science in all sorts of form. But too much of it is, this is good for you, you should read this, you should pay attention to it, you should watch this program, this will make you a better human being, right? It's the equivalent of eat your peas at the dining room table, right? The people do not get engaged at that level with anything, much less with science, where most people, you know, have a antithesis to being engaged in the first place. One of the problems is that we don't actually have very good evidence from social science about what has to be done to actually engage people in a democracy, to make citizens informed in a democracy. They haven't done enough case studies and looking at it, and they've got a natural world to work in, but they don't do it. I used to read all the social science literature as part of my job as a national science correspondent for for the Star, and before that, the National Science Correspondent for Southam News. And the topics that social scientists often choose to deal with are not actually related to the planet that I live on. Uh, and they don't choose to deal with things like which would be useful to have this type of, uh, and particularly people who study communications. So we don't know. We really don't know what we have to do to get people engaged. And we have to find out, and we have to work on that. And, James, you were talking about a plan to do that, and I think that's really very, very in, in, important. Part of that is going to involve the media. The media has to play a role in that. One of the problems here that we have to deal with, because it isn't going to change, is that reporters who have the training and capacity for insightful and accurate coverage of complex science issues, such as cl climate change, those type of reporters are far less common in newsrooms than reporters with the training and capacity for insightful and accurate coverage of professional hockey.
right? Most newsrooms have more people who can do accurate and professional coverage of, of hockey than they have people who can do accurate and professional coverage of science. They do that because you as the consumers don't care, right? It's not, they're responding to market forces. If they had bad coverage of hockey, you would cancel your subscription. I mean, now you don't know you'd also cancel it if they didn't have the horoscope in, but leave that out for now, right? <laughs> if they didn't do that, you'd cancel the subscription. If you don't have com you know, really good, insightful coverage of complex science, you grumble, but you don't actually do anything about it. And so they can go, they can go ahead and continue to do it because they're not paying any price for it, and they will go ahead and continue to do it. I think this says some commitment, something about the true commitment of media proprietors to the first topic I brought up, inform public debate by getting the public engaged. And it's not that they're poor and they're, you know, that it's terrible, we haven't got any money and we can't afford to do these things. These are people who made out like bandits throughout the 1970s and the 1980s and well into the 1990s. They could have invested that money at that time in training and retaining science reporters and none of them chose to do so, even though they had oodles and oodles and oodles of money. Typically between 20 and 25 percent return on investment for those of you who know something about business returns. So don't give me the poor, we couldn't afford to do it, a routine. There are definitely pressures today. News holes are definitely sinking today. Many newspapers are not making huge profits anymore, but almost all of them are still making profits. Almost all of them. So, third leg in this stool, or maybe the second leg, I've lost count. The communication of science demands that researchers understand the science of communications. Did you follow that neat little parallelism there? If you want to communicate science, you have to know about the science of communications. And if you can't do that because you're too busy with all the other things you do, you have to understand journalists, which is the shortcut to understanding the science of communications. If you know what makes journalists tick and what makes the media salivate, then you're going to be able to do a better job of communicating because you're pitching to a plate that you can actually see as opposed to throwing the baseball in the dark. It's much better to know where you want to go. What that means is we have to do, training is too much of a word and you would never talk about training PhDs. Um, they are by definition untrainable anyhow. Um, from a man who, you know, actually dines and sups with PhDs regularly. What that means is you have to show them in a rational way why journalism is irrational by their standards. And once they understand that, they're going to be much better at communicating because they will understand the different culture, different values, different norms, different peccadilloes of journalists. They won't approve of them. They'll still tut tut about them, but they'll know how to use them to their advantage. Um, and they might get a little bit better at things than the people at the Climate Research Unit in East Anglia. To, who, to whose materials I used to subscribe when I was reporting in this area regularly. A friend of mine who's on the governing board of the IPCC, sorry, just retired from the governing board of the IPCC, long time friend with a PhD, said that as far as he was concerned, what that uh, CRU, the Climate Change, Climate Research Unit at East Anglia material showed, and he actually read the emails, which I haven't done, was that they were arrogant, tribal, and naturally, and sorry, and, and not entirely transparent. In other words, they weren't transparent in their science, they were very tribal and sticking together, and they were quite arrogant about it. It's not me making this judgment. Remember the governing council of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change making this judgment who read the emails. My suspicion is that He's right, and that comes back to the science of communications and communicating science. If you're not transparent and you're arrogant and you're tribal, no one's going to believe you. You have no believability, so you have to work on that. Okay, the fourth leg of this three-legged stool. Social media and the Internet in general have greatly increased, increased accessibility to information. But these forces have also greatly reduced the ability of many people here in this theater to actually assess, to judge, to gauge, to rate the quality of all this information that's out there. 
right? How do you do it? It's just coming over you. You're drowning in, in data. Uh, and it comes, who knows where those websites are that Linda put up on the screen? Who knows whether that's some guy in his gotchi sitting in the basement, you know, <laughs> pumping stuff out or, a, you know, a team. You don't, you can't tell. It's very difficult to, to tell. So, and greater Assess accessibility without a concomitant accessibility is a really bad bargain if what you're hoping to do is help people have an intelligent debate. Okay, luckily, having painted this picture of doom and gloom, I have a solution. It is not the normal policy of people in the journalistic field to light candles. We are much better at cursing the darkness, but I actually have, you know, one little tiny candle I want to light. It's called the Science Media Center of Canada, and I and a bunch of others have been working for the last year and a half to get it launched. The launch date is Labor Day, which is approaching far faster than I would like. It is not an invention on our part. Science Media Centers already exist in the United Kingdom since 2002, in Australia since 2005, in New Zealand since 2009, and one is about to start in Japan, and one is about to start Denmark, so we're going to be sixth. I hate it. I wanted to be fourth, but we're not going to make it in time. Um, the purpose of the Science Media Center of Canada, the goal of the Science Media Center of Canada, is to excite Canadians about science. The way to do that is by engaging Canadians in informed discussion of issues that have a scientific dimension to them. And the route to do that is to help the general assignment reporters that you just heard about these dedicated professionals who have to deal with one story and then another story and another story, to give them helping hands when they're dealing with scientific questions. And we have a whole string of ways in which we're going to do that, and I'll be happy to bore you to death with it sometime later. At the same time, we intend to help scientists become better communicators with journalists by understanding journalists better. We're not going to give them media training about not wearing checkered shirts and always saying, well, Bruce, I'm glad, glad you asked that question. We're going we're gonna to teach them how to understand the people who are asking the question, and we think they're really intelligent people, and once they know that, they'll be able to handle it, and they won't need our help anymore. We hope the overall result of this was that it will improve science engagement by the public, but I can't tell you whether in the end it's going to nurture better informed citizens, because I don't know. There's no data to show me. I don't, can't tell you. But I do know that unless this and a lot of whole bunch of other ventures result in the general public taking ownership of climate science, actually taking it on, working to understand it, engaging with the issue of climate science, we're not going to get out of the current mess we're in. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, and, and to all the, uh, all the panelists. Now it's your opportunity uh, to uh, ask your questions. I'd ask you to line up. Uh, we have uh, microphones on both sides. Uh, what we're going to do, here's the, here's the, the house rules. Uh, you're going to be limited to 30 seconds. That's, that will be your time because there's lots of questions. Uh, I would ask you not to, make, uh, not to use this as an opportunity to espouse your views. Uh, do that quickly, but then get on to a question and ask a question. If you want to post it to any particular panelist, please uh, do so, or you can make it more general, and uh, we'll just go back and forth between the microphones. And I think what we'll do is start at this microphone. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. My name is Dr. Sean Peck. Um, it's fitting that this panel is being held in the Bob Wright Center for Ocean, Earth, and Atmospheric Science. Victoria has a fascinating local issue that brings into focus these sciences and public policy. The issue is the proposed and partly planned $1 billion land-based sewage treatment for the core area. Ten marine scientists, mostly from this great university, and six public health physicians have given their best judgment that the current engineered deep sea outfalls with preliminary screening and an exemplary source control program result in no measurable public health risk and a minimal effect on the environment. Recently, a reliable calculation has been carried out that 1.6 million tons of carbon dioxide equivalents 
will be created during the next 40 years by these plants. This includes 15,500 tons of CO2 during construction. It's been suggested that offset credits may be obtained that will not decrease the global... Uh, Can I ask you, you to will, move to the question? Okay, I will go. It will not decrease the global carbon footprint. I'll miss out my next bit. The question is, how could the media and the panel members assist in influencing public opinion to ensure that the best ocean, earth, and atmospheric science is used to influence a significant local public policy decision? Thank you. Uh, directed to any, any panelists want to pick this up? Wow. No, it's not mine. <laughs> Great. My first question is about sewage. <laughs> um, I think that um, one of the most useful things that the Times colonists can do and other media is to continue to bring the debate and the information to its readers. Um, I spoke yesterday at a gathering of uh, scientists and other media um, in support of the Science Media Centre of Canada. And I happen to have looked up how many articles the Times Colonist has published about sewage treatment in the last six months, which happens to be 139. So it's obviously a, a, a topic of vital concern to everybody in the capital region. We will continue to write about it in terms of influencing public opinion. Um, I think information is the best weapon. As a complete outsider and knowing nothing about your sewage problems, uh, I, what, what I would do as a science reporter approaching the story is you referred to a, a you know, a, I can't remember what the adjective was, but a very respectful or you know, a study which made the calculation about how much carbon dioxide would be added because of this. Uh, that will be a study, obviously, that makes certain assumptions before it does its calculations. I would go through that study and look at the assumptions, not so much the calculations, because I'm sure that the people did the math right, but to take the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, when they're talking about what's going to happen later on, they have what are called scenarios. And the scenarios say, all right, the Earth's population is going to increase by this much. And the next one says, no, it's going to increase by this much. And the next one says, it's going to be, oh, it's going to increase by this much, right? And depending on which scenario you apply, you get not too scary figures at the end or really, really frightening figures at the end. So the same thing with any, and I'm not picking on this study, the same thing with any study, like the classic ones, how much money this new stadium is going to bring to the town, right? I love those, right? Because when you actually look at them, the assumption is that everybody in town is going to go three times a day for the next 20 years, right? You know, that, But that's assumptions in the fine print at the back. Everyone looks at the, the math. The math is correct, yeah. But the assumption was wrong. So I would fact check and sort of check against reality, a reality check on the assumptions in that study before I started going off and saying, oh, it's a terrible thing, we better not do it because it's bad for the environment, bad for carbon dioxide. Hi, I'm Guy Dornsey, I'm author of the book The Climate Challenge, 101 Solutions to Global Warming, and I, I work full-time as a self-employed activist in the whole field of climate change, and right now we're being slaughtered. It's, it's, it's the worst that it's ever been in. The, the global media collectively, which is printed and Twittering and television and everything, the, the, the level of climate denial has risen dramatically in the last three months, including in Canada. I haven't got the data, but hearsay, um, anecdotally, I've heard that the students at one of Victoria's major high schools now think that climate change is a science created by business as a conspiracy to get more money for themselves. And I've also heard that donations are down by 25% to environmental groups because people say, well, climate change isn't an issue anymore. We don't really know. So we are being slaughtered. It's a really concern issue. I don't, I, there's a kind of complacency coming out of the media from you folks like, well, we just got to do this and that. It's really bad news because we're not getting the treaties through. So what do we do? How do we face this, you know, worst of all times when it comes to Copenhagen collapsing and they're slaughtering us on the climate science front? Jim or, or Michael, your thoughts? Well, I mean, I, it, you know, I actually really wish I knew the answer to that question. Um, you know, I certainly don't think it's all on the media's shoulders. You know, I think that, uh, you know, I was in Copenhagen and it wasn't pleasant. You know, it's, we, international governance is, I don't think, capable of 
dealing with this problem. I think that one thing we need to do is get scientists in front of Canadians and scientists in front of Americans and Europeans explaining this more clearly. Uh, so I agree with that. I think that somehow we need to engage people so we can talk about reality and move beyond these silly conversations about whether or not it's a problem. That, I think, is the very least we can do. Whether or not you can actually... I, I, I'm assuming that we can change it. I, I've never really thought that the problem was the money or the technology. It's whether or not we can actually convince ourselves to do something about it. And, uh, you know, how you do that, I, you know, I wish I knew the answer. <laughs> that would be a start. <laughs> uh, maybe I can just say a few words about what the Pacific Institute for Climate Solutions is doing. Your question is very well poised, I think, Guy. Uh, we have a, an active public lecture series now that we're beginning. Um, we're getting out in public, trying to convey to the public the gravity of the issue. Uh, but the approach that we're using is not just the, the kind of Al Gore inconvenient truth approach. What uh, our approach is, is to point out that if we rebuild our energy economy in the world, but with our focus being on Canada, there is a remarkable opportunity for us not only to produce a much better environment, but in fact to generate new economic wealth. And so we're intending to approach this from the economic side in conjunction with the scientific side. We are also about to launch in the next couple of months a series of short courses, and we are, our initial focus actually is a short course for journalists. Uh, I have spoken to some journalists, they're very keen because they, they would like to know a little bit more about the basics of climate science. And our intent there is simply to arm them with enough information so that they can ask the hard questions of a climate change denier or a scientist, it doesn't matter, as long as they have a higher level of understanding of the basic science, they'll be in a better position to know what questions to ask and to recognize when they are being duped. And then the, the third thing that we're doing is um, something else. Uh, let me think here. <laughs> I think, I think there's a third thing. Anyway, short courses and lectures. Um, oh, I, was, I know there was a third thing I was going to mention. I met uh, last week with the Minister of the Environment, Jim Prentice, in Ottawa. And uh, the approach that we used in that meeting was not to come at this from a doom and gloom, the earth is going to hell in a handbasket uh, uh, perspective, but rather to say, look, Canada is missing out right now on a, on a remarkable economic opportunity to generate new wealth for this nation by shifting the way in which we produce energy in this country. And I came at it from that perspective. And I think that that message tends to resonate with the current uh, party in power in Ottawa, and that's one that we need, I think, to focus, focus more on. I just wanted to, just one, you know, I don't want to leave in that sort of down note that I kind of left you in with. The, I, uh, if you look at uh, these numbers that I was talking about, public opinion polling, is particularly in the United States where I think it's very, very important what people are thinking on this issue. Um, the, there's a very, very strong uh, majority of Americans who want to see, see more clean jobs more clean energy. There, there's uh, well high, into the high 60s uh, percentage of Americans who are in favor of strong international agreements and uh, green jobs. So I think this model of actually trying to, you know, if you think that we're only going to do something about this if everybody agrees with this, we're only going to do something about this if everybody understands it, that's probably not a great model, but most I think most opinion leaders are getting this, and I, th and I think that there's real positive um, polling results with opinion leaders in Canada and the United States. So I, I, I'm optimistic that you could, you could actually do something if you could get leaders to, to, to actually act on it. My name is Paul McRae. I'm a former editorial writer for the Times Colonist. I've worked for the Globe and Mail, and I've been spending the last three years researching a book on climate change, and I've come to quite different conclusions on this. One of the things that I wish we had on this panel was a little bit more of that journalistic balance. Everybody on the panel has one side, you're not hearing the other. Mr. Hogan says that if he, if you could read his book, you'd be outraged. I can assure you, if you read my book, and I had my 15 minutes, you'd be outraged at what's going on on the other side of this issue. But let me give you one example. Phil Jones, former head of the Climatic Research Unit, Interviewed by the BBC 
in February the 13th, saying that there has been no statistically significant warming since 1995, and there's been slight cooling since 2002. One of Mr. Jones's jobs as the Climate Research Unit was to keep that information out of the public eye, lest people lose their faith in the global warming hypothesis. Could I ask you to get to the, your question? The question is this. How can the planet be both warming and cooling at the same time? In other words, Phil Jones, major climate guy, agrees with Rex Murphy. I've got the answer to that. I'll be happy to answer that. Um, uh, Mr. McRae, first of all, you've taken what Phil Jones said directly out of context. He did not say at all that there has been no statistically significant warming since 1995. What he said was that if you understand statistics, 19 times out of 20, we would have anticipated to see warming. In fact, what we saw was that it was 18.6 times out of 20 that we've seen warming in the statistical analysis of the data. And that means that in terms of passing a statistical test, we were slightly shy of the 95% confidence interval. Okay? So what, if you read all of what Phil Jones said, and if you go to the BBC transcript, you'll see that he said there is global warming going on. It has been going on for a long time, and it continues to go on. And, and keep in mind that the last 13 years, in those last 13 years, the 10 warmest years in all of human recorded history have been registered. And January was the fifth warmest January in history, and February was the sixth warmest, or vice versa, I may have them mixed up. And March is going to come in very warm when the data are out in a week or so. We're already en route, because of El Nino, we're already en route to 2010, likely being the warmest year in all of recorded human history. So your point is absolutely false. It's absolutely false, and I accuse you of cherry picking. And you're doing that directly. Read the full, tr read the I, full could transcript. I, uh, call this, could I call this uh, to a halt? Um, I'm going to, uh, before I move over to this uh, side, uh, just to prove that we are doing things virtually, uh, we have a question that's come in over, over the uh, internet, and I do want to uh, pose this. Um, to what extent has shrinking newsrooms affected the quality of science and climate change coverage? I guess that's a question to uh, Lucinda and or uh, to uh, Peter. Shrinking newsrooms uh, has definitely, I think, had an influence on how we cover things and what we choose to cover. Um, what I would say about that is, although it is a factor, um, as Peter has outlined, uh, newspapers have lost, I think, an interest in science reporting for a much longer period of time than there were shrinking newsrooms. In fact, newsrooms have only been sort of contracting for the last oh, five or six years, I would say. Whereas the steady decline in science journalism has been going on for much longer than that. So obviously, shrinking newsrooms are a concern to me and to every journalist in Canada. I'll just come back to the point that, by and large, newspapers, this doesn't go for the CBC as well, but by and large, newspapers and broadcasting outlets are people that have to be responsive to their readers and viewers and to listeners. Um, yes, the majority of their income comes from advertisers, but anyone who looks at it knows that the purpose of a newspaper is to print articles so that they can sell the readers to the advertisers. That's why you separate the, the advertisements with that other stuff, right, to spread it, spread it out. The, the, mo the, the, the model, the economic model, is you're selling your readers to the advertisers. No reporter thinks that. By the way, I want to make perfectly clear that most reporters, if all the people in the advertising department were to fall over a cliff, wouldn't bat an eye in most cases, right? <laughs> Just so you understand that. But if you look at it, but coming to, to directly to the question, I will, Howard. Um, the Toronto Star uh, used to publish uh, a section dealing with science. I have mixed feelings about 
ghetto sections in newspapers or boutique sections in newspapers because they tend not to be read by people who aren't interested, but at least they publish it. Then they went to two pages a week about science, and then they went to no pages a week about science. And I thought, you know, I was still getting my stuff in the paper because I was largely writing for the A section of the paper and for the insight and weekend sections of the paper. But I thought, well, this is really interesting. Uh, I wonder if there's been any sort of public outcry about this. So I checked with the appropriate people at the Star, and basically there had been none. I mean, a little bit, but just background noise, right? Could have been the same as the paper was wet today when you delivered it sort of thing. Here we are in a place which thinks it has the Harvard of the North in the University of Toronto, right? Has three other universities, you know, right in the city limits, basically speaking, is surrounded by uh, research intensive universities and McMaster and Waterloo and London and all those places, right? Has a huge amount of people who work in the field of science and none of them or almost none of them, could be bothered to pick up a telephone or type an email or put a postage stamp on a letter to the editor of the Toronto Star and say, why don't you have more science in the paper? If we'd stop covering the Blue Jays, guess what would have happened, right? So it's not here, but it's your fault. I'm sorry. If people have been cutting science out of the papers, it's because editors can get away with it and they don't have to pay a penalty when they do it. Over to this... Uh Microphone. Uh, Sue Hiscox, we organized three conferences on ozone depletion and climate change back in the 90s, ending in the year 2000. We invited experts from around the world. The conclusion was the same as the chart in the Al Gore movie, Inconvenient Truth. And the prediction was there would be more snow, more rain, more drought, and it would be more intense and more unpredictable. The ozone depletion creates a situation that's the greatest destabilizing influence on the atmosphere, which explains partly the uh, sometimes you do get that cold influence, but still the, the planet is, is warming significantly. My concern is that we're losing our fishing, our forests, our seasonal activities, our health is being affected by increases in things like everything from increases in malaria to various uh, viruses and so forth that are... Can we are, have the question, please? Yes, I do. I think, uh, Jim Hogg, and I would suggest that you would agree with the idea of charging the people who are responsible for failing to, to relay the facts to the public with crimes against humanity. That's what a lot of us would like to see. Um, I, I, I'm not sure about that. I, I want, um, <laughs> you know, sometimes I, I, I would agree with you. But I do think that more transparency in uh, regulations so that these front groups, particularly in the United States, but to a certain degree in Canada, you don't have to uh, declare who you're representing and who's actually funding you in some of these groups. So it's very easy for them to hide who they actually represent. I think if there was more transparently, transparency, in the United States it's actually going in the other direction because of a recent Supreme Court of the U.S. Uh, decision that uh, this is a very, very big problem because people, it makes it so much easier to fool people about this stuff. I, I was wondering if we could suggest that the Times colonists be really bold in the next few days and have on the front page all the slides that Dr. Peterson put on, because that was one of the most effective defenses of climate change I have seen. And why not do that? How many in the room would think that would be a good idea? Okay. Now my question, my question is. Oh, I was going to answer the, that. Well, I'll, no, uh, well I'm, I, I know you're going to answer after, but I want to get my question in before I'm asked to leave. Oh. Um, Jim, Jim Hogan, I believe you were somewhat involved with the TickTick.org campaign. Now, there's a perfect example of AstroSurf. Uh, at Copenhagen, there were so many people there going tick, 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 tick. And what happened was that this was a PR campaign. The, the logo 
The logo was registered by Havis PR firm that represents nuclear energy and also Euro, which represents the biofuel industry. And here, 250 NGOs had signed on to Tick, Tick, Tick. And what did Tick, Tick ask for? Not a 40% reduction. Not of 1990 could, levels. Could I ask you to come to your, que your well, second my question? question? <laughs> my question is, I think that you were promoting AstroTurf by initiating being involved with an NGO group that purported to be NGOs but was closely linked, closely linked to the corporate sector. And so this is very ironic that I know that you wrote this other book, but I think what has happened is that there has been a perpetuation of the oh, problem you. that you were trying to correct and you have been part of it. I, I would so ask I you, thank you very much. Um, any response? Well, I'm, I, I'm certainly not aware of that and I, I, I doubt very much whether or not that's actually true. Uh, these, the tick, tick, tick was basically, it's, it was made up of the world's major environmental organizations. No, it wasn't. You know that. No, it, it was. Well, who registered? Have okay, we're going to move over uh, to this no, microphone. Oh, I'm sorry. Lucinda's going to answer your first question. Yes. Uh, I don't think that that actually qualifies as news. We've run information like that in the past in the Times Colonist about the inexorable and undeniable trends in global warming. So. Unless there's something new that uh, you can come up with, Tom, I'll uh, take that suggestion under advisement and wait for a bulletin. And in fact, there is nothing new there. All of that, all of the data I showed, and all of the graphs are available, freely available on public websites. Thank you. Over to this uh, microphone. Bill <clears throat> Davidson. I'm a citizen. Uh, frustrated one. I thought you've all done a beautiful job in uh, nice calm uh, presentation. I'm uh, really excited myself. Uh, I got a tweet before I came here from CO2 Now. We are at 2.29 parts per million higher than we were a year ago. Um, I've also heard from scientists that uh, if we don't peak and start bringing down CO2 and other uh, uh, emissions within five years, then we will have hit some kind of uh, point where things are really going to get uh, really nasty and unpredictably nasty. So all of the solutions and the talking tonight is just like, man, you know, it's been three or four months since Copenhagen. It's uh, like time's ticking by. I want a big clock saying we've got uh, four years and uh, Can I so just ask months. you if you have a question? That's just it. I want a response. Oh. Because <laughs> any, any response to those Well, only that your point is well taken. Um, CO2 continues to rise. The rate of increase is, is actually going up right now. Uh, it is very worrying, and we do need to act quickly. I want from a, from a, to write from a, with me. From a journalist point of view, I covered the conference at the UK Met Service Station in Exeter, which talked about un, unstoppable climate change. I was there for three days and listened to all the people talk and talked, interviewed many of the top people and went through the models and everything else. And from my point of view as a, you know, somebody looking on, I don't think that much is to be gained in terms of informing the public debate with apocalyptic types of prog prognosis. Because the people who were there, and they were the world's experts in trying to figure out what would happen if you had a a temperature increase of two degrees centigrade. Uh, couldn't say. They didn't know. They didn't know whether there was going to be a steady state or whether suddenly things would flip over, where the albedo ch would change would be so much you would get run away. They could not say with not even the, not the 19 times out of 20 percentage of certainty, but even a 5 out of 100 times of certainty. They just didn't know. So saying, I've been told that five years from now we're all going to be dead unless we stop breathing or emitting carbon dioxide, <laughs> I don't think it's terribly helpful. I'm sorry from my point of view. Uh, just uh, for those at the microphones, we're, we're going to end this in five minutes, and I, and I apologize for those of you who can't get questions in, but just so that you're aware. So over to this microphone. Vicki Husband, and I really applaud Peter Calamai's uh, approach to this and the uh, 
Science Media Center of Canada is way overdue, and I'm really delighted. And as Barbara Yaffe said, we are, uh, Canada is becoming an environmental slob. That was the latest thing I read in the paper. And what are we going to do? I thought it was really good. Uh, what are we going to do about our government? And my question is really about what's happened to uh, the Environment Canada scientists and the muzzling of the scientists. And the, the news reports on them are down 80%, I understand. And they've also cut sci as science funding for climate change research, and this is really serious. And the Environment Canada scientists are in this building. They cannot talk to the media. Could some of you comment on that issue? Because I think it, it's extremely serious as we talk about scientists being able to communicate with the public and learning how to communicate better with the media, and they're not allowed to talk. The muzzling of scientists uh, is an extremely uh, serious concern for journalists. Obviously, if we can't reach people to get informed opinion about what's actually happening, if it has to be cleared and processed through a, you know, a labyrinthine procedure that prevents us from getting information, that's a huge concern. It's a concern that we have expressed in the past, and we will continue to push back. And your related issue that you raised about support for climate change research or climate research uh, writ large, uh, there is something in Canada called the Canadian Foundation for Climate and Atmospheric Sciences. It was founded in the year 2000 with a subvention from the Chrétien government of uh, $60 million. Uh, another $50 million was added in 2006 in the Martin government. That body supports most of the climate research going on in Canada and in the budget that came down on March 4th, the federal budget, there was no renewal of the funding. And so the Canadian Foundation for Climate and Atmospheric Sciences is now in its final year of operation and will likely close its doors on March 31st of 2011. <coughs> I personally, I happen to sit on the board of that foundation and I'm very concerned about what it means for climate science research in Canada because we're already seeing an exodus of bright minds from this country who are saying, God, the funding's running out, I'm going to go elsewhere. Meanwhile, we have Mr. Obama south of the border putting a lot of money into climate research. And so the pastures are green south of the border, they're less green here at the moment. And I hope that the government will realize that they made a little bit of an error there. I'm the eternal optimist. and. Uh, and I would ask that the public perhaps raise their voice and say what's going on here. Howard, I'd like you to add however much time I take to make this point to the time available for these speakers who they couldn't suffer, shouldn't suffer because I wanted to get my oar in for one minute. But on this question of you know, the problem with environment scientists, environment Canada science being muddled and not just environment Canada science being muscles, other science-based departments in Ottawa. The Canadian Science Writers Association, I'm now switching hats for a minute here, at its annual meeting at the beginning of June has decided that the way we're going to tackle this is bring in the Deputy Minister of Fisheries who is designated as the champion for science within the federal public service. Claire, Des Claire Donsoro is her name. She's, her, she's the designated champion, science champion is her title in the public service. We're going to bring her in on a panel and we're going to ask her what her view is of the importance of government scientists being able to, to transmit uh, their information. We're not going to go in and beat up on her. There's absolutely no point doing that. What we want to do is get her to say what the official position of the public service is because we know it differs from the official position of the government of Canada, right? And if we can get that on record from the champion for science, then we will use that in our campaign to get various ministers and people to change their minds. Yeah, blaming, you know, yelling, jumping up and down, turning purple in the face and pointing fingers isn't going to change the minds of the people who run the various ministers' office for the Harper government. But a nice argument like that might, might, so um, in the interest of, of fairness and time, I'm going to take the question here and the question here, and then I'm afraid uh, that will be it for questions, uh, and then we'll wrap up. So to this microphone. Thank you very much. Scott Sutherland, uh, and a former journalist. I did it for about 30 years and ended up as a senior correspondent with the National Wire Service. And I dealt with, uh, with editors who wanted me to leave greenhouse gas out of my stories because it was too technical a term. Uh, 
I, I just still like to ask questions, and, uh, and as a grandfather now, I'm really interested in solutions. Um, this is uh, directed to, to Dr. Pedersen. Um, I'm wondering uh, whether uh, the, the scheme that this Nathan Mirvold in, uh, in Seattle has come up with for a strato shield, bleeding SO2 into the, uh, the upper atmosphere, really is the kind of solution to global warming. Um, you, were, you were alluding to Mount Pinatubo and what happened then. Um, and I'm just, you know, I don't know whether I'm being duped by thinking that there might be a solution to this rather than the planet is, is going to dump all life off it. Well, it's a very good question. You're not being duped. Um, this falls under the category of what we call geoengineering. And the notion is that human beings can engineer the planet in some way to perhaps reduce the amount of sunlight that's arriving at the Earth's surface and thus combat global warming. It needs more research, but it is hugely dangerous. And it doesn't answer two other issues. And those two other issues that I think are critical to this kind of discussion is, first of all, the moral hazard argument that by God, you know, we can continue to burn coal and use up our oil because we've got a magic solution where we can put mirrors or sulfate aerosols or something in space to repel sunlight. So there's a very strong moral hazard argument. The more important one from an ecological perspective is that the ocean is slowly going acid because we're dissolving extra carbon dioxide into it. And when you dissolve carbon dioxide in water, it releases hydrogen ions, acid, protons. Those react with carbonate ions. And carbonate ions are a fundamental building block of all organisms that produce their skeletons in the sea from calcium carbonate. Oysters, clams, there's some plants called coccolithophoridae that also do that. Coral reefs. And the experts in this area now are relatively confidently predicting better than 18.6 times out of 20, that the Great Barrier Reef, for example, will likely not exist in its current form by the year 2100. In fact, it may well be dead. We are on the verge of starting to lose our coral reefs from the world's oceans because of the acidification issue. Geoengineering schemes that block the sun's rays do nothing to ameliorate or mitigate the acidification issue. And that's a big one, and it's not spoken about often enough. Well, Elizabeth May, I've got a bunch of things just in terms of quick comments, but I'm not going to make them. I'm just going to stick to my question, except one for you, Peter Calamai, which is, and Peter and I, by the way, have known each other since, I, since we hosted a climate conference in 1988, and you covered it. And nowadays, if we had a conference like that, there wouldn't be the people there who knew how to cover it, which is part of our problem. But Claire Dansrow, at right now, at the level down to the director general level in government departments, speeches and statements they make to media have to be pre-approved by the PMO. And I don't think you'll get her to say much, but good luck. Um, the question I have is not about the, 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 you know, the, the Rex Murphys, who, by the way, is now moved to the National Post, so we won't see him in the Globe and Mail anymore, um, <laughs> or, or Margaret Wente, or any of them. But looking at good, solid coverage, like what we saw from Lucinda from the Times Colonist, leaving aside the people who deliberately get it wrong, we don't get it right often enough. We don't cover it enough. And what I am concerned about, and I want your comments on this, is the absence of coverage, the stories we never see. Like what happened at Copenhagen was never really explained in any Canadian media outlet I saw. There was no post-Copenhagen coverage worth noticing. There was no real coverage that Canada changed its target after Copenhagen and weakened it further. There was no coverage of lots of coverage of the attack on the CRU unit at East Anglia, but I didn't see very much at all in any papers across Canada for the House of Commons in the UK exoneration of Phil Jones and saying that in the accusations of dishonesty there is no case to be met. I haven't seen anything about the fact that Canada is hosting a G8 summit, which for the first time in more than a decade there will be no environment ministers gathering in a pre-G8 ministers meeting, or that as host government we're keeping climate change off the agenda of the G20, and I see nothing in the papers about the Climate Change Accountability Act and the vote coming up on April 14th that everybody should be emailing and phoning, particularly liberal MPs, to say get there and vote for C311. These are issues we don't read so people can't react and they can't engage. What do we do about absent stories?
every day the Times colonist in every newspaper in North America makes choices about what stories they can run and what stories they can't. Pardon me? Uh, I don't actually remember a story about a dog or a cat on the front page for some time, but... Uh, yeah, we're, we're focusing on the rabbits at the university right now. <laughs> yeah, and we, we want to talk to you about that. Yeah. Yeah. Very seriously, um, the local orientation of most newspapers in major cities or medium-sized cities has affected the balance of our coverage. And in the... Even as recently as the 1990s, there was a greater... I think a greater sort of balance between local, national, local, provincial, national, and international coverage in every Canadian newspaper. But as newspapers fight for survival and news hole, when we decide what we're going to focus, again, coming back to um, what can we deliver to our readers that nobody else can, it's local news. And that has bumped some of those issues out of the newspaper. And... Every day there are also complaints about why aren't we covering cricket and why aren't we covering the rugby finals. You know, there are various interest groups and every day our selections are based on what we think is, first of all, local and unique, and second, what we can fit. I agree with you about Copenhagen. and I retired June of 2008, so I'm absolved. But uh, I agree with you about Copenhagen uh, not being very well reported in Canada by anybody. The Science Media Centers uh, arranged a, a unit there. We pooled our resources, even we who don't officially exist yet, to set up a unit there to help advise reporters who are coming to the to the conference about very, anything they want to know, a factual basis. And then we surveyed what had happened afterwards. There was nobody there from any place in Canada, just for starters. Um, the coverage in Australia and New Zealand was marginal at best. There were a couple of freelancers there. They didn't get much in the papers or on the air at ABC. The European coverage varied tremendously in quality and quantity. So it wasn't just Canada is what I'm trying to say. And I think largely the air has gone out of that balloon because most people thought beforehand nothing of consequence was going to come out of the conference. And therefore, it's like the stock market discounting a stock before it actually sinks. They discounted the news. There is an excellent article in the current issue of the CMOS Bulletin, and that's the first time I've read anything that actually told me what happened there from a Canadian. Well, this, uh, this is bringing uh, tonight uh, to a conclusion, and I, I sure hope that uh, everyone has come away with a greater, deeper understanding of some of the complexities and issues of how the media and how scientists uh, rea interreact and interplay. Um, and while it's easy to point fingers, probably, for saying the confusion around climate is perhaps the problem of the media or perhaps the problem of the scientists, uh, I think the other message here is the real issue is the personal responsibility each one of us take for becoming aware and knowledgeable about what these issues are. So you've done that tonight. I encourage you to continue doing it, uh, and we hope to see you here at other events. I would really like to thank our panelists. Uh, excellent. And to remind you that Jim's book's for sale out front, uh, Climate Cover-Up. Um, but we also really want to thank you for coming. We know uh, coming out of the middle of the week is difficult. It's late. Uh, it's, it's cold. Uh, but you've really made this a wonderful, wonderful event. I'm sorry we didn't get to everyone's questions. I'm sure if you want to stay in network, we'd love to have you do that. So good evening. Tom, I think when you have...